fundamental question in economics and psychology is what are our goals? How do we behave? Um, what, what, are, what is it out in the world that uh, attracts us and makes us seek something out? And some of these are, um, some of the things we seek out are, are pretty easy to intuit. You know, like food, water, maybe some, you know, opposite sex kind of thing. Uh, but some, some are sort of more, um, more abstract. And um, one big area that people have been interested in is, is, is social. You know, how is it that, that we interact with other people? We're a very social species. You know, what is it about the social world that draws our, our, our behavior? And there's, there's been a lot of interest in, in things like altruism. So it, it turns out that even when people are given the chance to be very unfair to other people, they're, they, they're not. So there's a classic game called the ultimatum game where you can propose a split of a certain amount of money and if the, the poor sucker who has to decide whether this is a fair split or not um, declines it, then they, lose, then they don't get any money in, in the end. So you put them in this very unfair position and people are very fair. They make very even splits, much more even than you, would, than you should rationally predict. And, and the explanation for this is that we have this preference for fairness and for, um, that, that gives rise to things like altruism. There, you know, exactly all the different components of, of the social world and, and social motivations that, that, um, that interact to guide our behavior with other people are really, really kind of hard to track down. But there's, there's at least one other that is really fundamental, and it's competition. So, uh, so not only do, do we tend to be fair, in some, but in other circumstances, we tend to really like to dominate people. Um, and uh, so one thing that's, that's been well known and well appreciated is that in both humans and other animals, your happiness and your well-being doesn't just depend on how much money or resources you personally have. It has to do much more with how much resources you have relative to other people, which is a strange and very troubling fact, but it's just a fact. Um, so, you know, the wealthy people in very poor countries do much better than the poor people in relatively wealthy countries, even though they may have fewer resources and fewer access to health care and, and worse food and so on. They're just healthier people, they live longer, they're happier, and it's, it's just a big problem. And the, answer, the, the hypothesis that explains this is that you drive happiness not just from how you are doing, but how you are doing relative to others. So this is probably another really fundamental um, human motivation, and it, it shows up a lot in the, world, in the real world. So one area where this really shows up is in this phenomenon known as the winner's curse. The winner's curse is a, has a beautiful name, um, uh, and it, to describe it, it's good just to back up a little bit. So it, the winner's curse shows up in, in auctions. So auctions are, everybody knows what an auction is, is where there's a limited amount of resources and multiple people competing for access to those resources. The winner's curse shows up in, in auctions in which the resource under consideration has some fixed value. It's a, like a real true value. It's just the people are uncertain about how, how good it is. The, 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 famous, the most famous um, case of, of the winner's curse showed up in, in drilling rights for, for oil. So it, in, in America, in the Gulf of Mexico, the, uh, the government would auction off um, plots of land where you can drill for oil, and then different oil companies would bid for the right to, to drill there, and then they would, whoever paid the most money got the right to, to drill and, and would reap the benefits. But it turned out that they didn't really reap the benefits. Because of the competition, the people, the companies that went, won the auctions tended to pay more than the actual oil was worth. And it, it's a, it was a sort of a big mystery for why, why this is the case. Why is it that, that these um, companies were paying more than the actual value of the oil? And this is where the name the winner's curse comes from. It's because the companies that won later on would curse themselves for having paid too much. And um, there, there's been a, you know, work recently arguing that this depends on competition. So if you could do the same kind of experiments in, the lab in a laboratory, you bring a bunch of people in, you have them compete for a limited resource, um, make bids for how much they wish to pay for it, and then they, they, you pay them for in the experiment based on how much they pay for the, for the good under auction relative to its true value. And even in these scenarios, you find that people, they can learn, they can get better at the task, 
They can make, you know, they, at first they start to lose a lot of money. People are overly aggressive in their bidding, but then they get better and better and better. And as they get better and better and better, they, they, they lose less money, but they never stop losing money. And um, some of the famous experiments in this, in, in economics, showed that people, even if you have subjects come back, become professional subjects essentially, come back over months and months and months, they never stop losing money. So this winner's curse is this persistent effect. They, they do this even though there are real consequences. So one of my favorite studies ever uh, um, had people come in and do this auction experiment. And if they lost money, and so they, they ended up in the red, so they ended up losing money overall, they made them work to pay it back. So they had to sweep the floor of the economics building to pay back the money that they had lost in the experiment. And they still continued to lose money. They couldn't help themselves. Um, so some of the studies we've been doing has been trying to figure out well, what's going on in, in these tasks. And, and really our, our answer is, is that we, we think that there are two fundamental um, components to this. One is just how in the world do people learn how to bid in this task at all? Um, this is the, sort of the first part that we've been trying to answer. You know, what are the processes? The, the sort of the one standard explanation is you, know, you, you reason through. You, you have some estimate about how valuable the thing is, and you reason through how you should bid relative to that estimate to, some, to guarantee that you make some, some profits. Um, but we don't think that's really what happens. We think what happens is people receive an estimate, they try it out, if they lose money, then they, they bid a little bit less the next time, and then they, they adjust their bid in this way. And we have good evidence that this is actually the case. So you can, you can track behavior trial by trial in this experiment, and you can, you can predict how they, how they bid just by assuming that they try something out and then adjust based on wins or losses. But even if you just adjust in this way, you should still eventually arrive at the optimal solution and make money on the task. Um, so what we've shown now is that um, that's, it's not just you know, learning from wins and losses, it's also something about the competition. So if people, um, if, if you change the social environment in some way, then people, the, the, it's the effect of the size of the winner's curse changes as well. So we put people in a highly competitive situation. So I'm at Stanford University, a professor at Stanford. The, the, our arch rival is University of California, Berkeley. So we brought people into the lab and made them believe that they were bidding against other students at Berkeley, and they lost much more money than if they thought they were bidding against Stanford students. So that's evidence that there's something about the social environment. If you make them believe that they're bidding against computer opponents, then they don't overbid at all. Um, and it, so, so there's really something about the social atmosphere, and we think it's something directly about competition. That there's something about wanting to win the auction, to be the winner, to be the one who emerged out of the group of competitors with the good in hand that um, drives people to, to overbid. Um, and it, it's very much related to this, you know, this basic social drive to dominate. Um, there, there's some hormones associated with this drive as well. So the most famous is testosterone. So testosterone levels, it, it rises in testosterone are associated with increased drive for social status or intention to social status. And we've shown that overbidding in the winner's curse scales with the amount of testosterone in individual people. So we did this just in men, but in, in men, if you just you know, measure the amount of testosterone in their system, the, the people with higher levels of testos testosterone tend to bid more and then lose more money on the task than people with lower levels of testosterone. And we've also tracked it down in, into the brain so we've taken these two sets of processes. One is the trial by trial learning. And we've shown that we can identify brain systems, in particular this dopamine system that's located in the midbrain. We've shown that we can track activity in, this do in the dopamine system and show that it changes trial by trial in a manner that predicts um, this sort of eventual convergence in learning that, that occurs. But there are other systems that are associated with social cognition. So there's a brain region called the temporal parietal junction which is really critical for thinking about other people and reasoning in the social environments. Another area called the anterior insula, which interacts with the temporal parietal um, cortex to help you to navigate, this, navigate social environments and social, um, yeah, just social networks, I guess. Um, so there, these two systems interact, and we showed that when you win or lose an auction, that these brain areas are active, and the degree to which they're active predicts the degree to which you overbid. Um, so there's something about evaluating the social environment, trying to establish yourself as dominant within there, 
that leads act to activity in these so social cognition related areas of the brain that interact with basic valuation systems to lead people to overbid. And I think this, this level, this type of um, study, trying to pull apart different social motives, identify the brain circuits associated with them, to identify exactly how it is that we evaluate our social world and change our behavior and change the way we evaluate things on the basis of these evaluations. It's really fundamental to understanding how our social systems, how we interact as a social species and what the different motives are that drive our behavior when we interact with others.